good morning, everyone. This is the uh, final presentation. Just give you a quick update on uh, vegetable insects. We already had a very good discussion on insect issues with uh, Dr. Keshheimer's talk uh, on hemp insects. And uh, it's really incredible to see uh, so much progress on the hemp front, both on the organic and conventional side. So here again, I'm going to try to summarize some of our insect monitoring um, issues, things we are uh, seeing and um, getting to know of uh, from farmers and crop consultants. So again, uh, if you have any feedback, just uh, text me. You have my cell phone on the screen. Just text me and um, it really informs me if you're seeing something unusual. Uh, we also have the team newsletter and uh, hopefully you're subscribed to our uh, Commercial Horticulture Extension Facebook page um, where you can watch many other uh, webinars. And remember to download the Farming Basics phone app. Now, just a quick uh, non-discrimination statement. We provide uh, our services uh, to everybody without any discrimination. Uh, Alabama Extension and Auburn University are equal opportunity provider. Just a quick look at the drought map. I always start with the weather. Uh, and right now, this is a bit, maybe 10 days old, but uh, I don't think much has changed. We don't have, um, we, we have extremely dry spots uh, in certain parts of the states, but overall um, it's just hot and dry, but uh, may not be in a drought. But keep a, keep a watch on the USDA drought monitor. Um, and this is actually on the University of Nebraska website. So just check out and, and make sure you're aware of the weather around you. Insect-wise, uh, now these are uh, based on uh, the scouting and the insect monitoring that is done by uh, uh, my staff and as well as several of the regional extension agents around the state. And what you're looking at are the total number of insects. Uh, for example, beet armyworm, the total numbers uh, from last week. Uh, I will send out another update later this week. Uh, and uh, then you're looking at the average numbers of those moths for a trap. So these are moths. Remember with the monitoring stations we have, these are sticky wing traps. We want to trap uh, adults, not the larvae. Uh, and I put those uh, larvae in, the, in, in there so that you can recognize that insect, not that we are trapping them. And then if you look at the map, uh, these are the heat maps and you can see the, uh, the dots, there are the blue dots on the screen. So for beet armyworm, the larger the dot, the more pressure, more intense pressure is out there. Now, some locations may not be even on this map. We have about 20 locations, but uh, or 21, but you can't see all of them because uh, the other locations just don't have much pressure and it's almost invisible right now. But we are monitoring across multiple locations. And it's, as you can see, I've compared beet armyworm with fall armyworms here. Uh, beet armyworms are way ahead of the fall armyworm this year, which is kind of the normal pattern, especially on the vegetable commercial farms that we're monitoring as well as research stations. I uh, remember last year was very unusual. Uh, we had fall, fall armyworms uh, way past, almost seven times more fall armyworm uh, activity. And that's why so many outbreaks were reported for fall armyworms last year. Uh, this year, the beet armyworms are, are back. So it seems like this is one of those normal years maybe uh, with this dry heat uh, and drought-like conditions almost. But you can, those numbers uh, tell the story and the maps kind of show you where they are. Uh, the, again, the beet armyworms are very um, active in the south compared and they're smaller and lower numbers as you go to North Alabama. So these are really informative to do, uh, to do these. Oops, I didn't want to do that. I'll to go to the next slide. Oops, I don't know where. Okay, I need to advance. Okay, so here's the uh, numbers for the uh, Southern armyworm and yellow striped armyworm. Again, these are these multiple species. Um, you'll see these, uh, these two, the Southern armyworm and yellow striped armyworm have these patterns on their bodies. Um, and the Southern has the yellow head uh, or the red head uh, on the uh, caterpillar. So again, um, southern armyworm by far is actually the, the highest numbers. So if you had to compare all the armyworms, 
You have the Southern army worm really bad uh, in, this, in this deep south. Uh, then you got the beet army worms. Then you have the fall and the yellow striped army worm. So uh, almost in that order. So these army worms are very active. So make sure you're scouting your crops um, wherever you are. Um, it, it's insects are not sleeping. They are active. You just have to go look for them. And these army worms, they really like uh, the hay and pasture fields first, and they start to move to the crops from row crops to horticultural crops. Uh, and they feed on multiple weed species as well as crops. So uh, keep looking for these caterpillars and take good pictures. If you are confused, I try my best to identify them. Sometimes they're very confusing. Don't take just one picture. Try to take pictures from different angles when you're sending these pictures uh, for identification. It really helps us. Here's a tomato fruit worm, uh, which is Again, a very common insect pest, also called corn earworm. Uh, it, feels on, it feeds on multiple crops, I think, including hemp that we just heard from. But uh, again, tomato fruitworm is way ahead of tobacco budworms, it seems. Now, we're not monitoring all the row crops. Uh, uh, tobacco budworm it could be very high in certain areas where you have more of the row crops like peanuts and soybeans and other crops. Uh, so this data could be a little biased. Um, towards the, the tomato fruit worm or the corn ear worm. But again, you can see the, the pressures. Uh, interesting thing is tobacco bud, bud worms uh, are far less, but the pressure is almost similar across uh, the, uh, the state. So that is really interesting. And remember, these many of these insects will ride the storms and the, and the hurricanes when they come. So um, make sure you're scouting the crops after every crop event. Uh, every weather event, excuse me. Uh, cabbage loopers actually have skyrocketed. I, I just compiled, uh, looked at hundreds of traps this over this weekend, and the numbers will certainly change. Uh, the cabbage looper pressure has gone up, uh, but you can see the, it's, a, it's one of those pests that's not just a rural, in rural parts of Alabama, it's also an urban pest. Uh, it flies really well, these loopers, uh, are large moths and uh, they will spread easily with storms. And you may start seeing them with, when, on crops. Uh, and the one, the soybean looper uh, will actually increase uh, in, a, in a month or two. So it goes on and, and of course uh, likes to feed on soybean and other crops uh, and those numbers will change. But certainly cabbage looper is very active right now and the numbers have, have jumped. So. Uh, it will feed, it almost is a, like a secondary pest on, on tomatoes and other crops. You don't see them much, but they, they might be there mixed up with these other caterpillars. So keep an eye out uh, for these loopers. And then finally, uh, here are some drought indicators. And uh, as I sh showed you on the map, I mean, it's really hot and dry across the state. And uh, lesser corn stock borer, it's a pest in peanuts and soybeans. It's not really a vegetable pest. Not so much a vegetable pest, um, but um, I include that in our traps because it's an excellent um, way to tell if the ground is thirsty. If the soil is thirsty, you'll see a lot more of these lessers and these adults flying. So, and those numbers are incredibly high, as you can see from all the rest of the insects you saw, which tells us that there's an impending drought. So it's this drought-like conditions. So watch out if you are a row crop producer, definitely watch out. Uh, but if you're a uh, vegetable producer, and uh, we're monitoring these so you can see the hot spots. It's, it's all over the, the state. Uh, compared that to squash wine borer, again, uh, an insect that loves the dry. Uh, and if you have plants infested, they're going to succumb to vine borers much earlier than uh, a wet year because the plants are stressed. The borers will, will uh, stop the vascular system or uh, disrupt the vascular system, and the plants die sooner. So Watch out for these insects, extremely high pressure everywhere uh, we are seeing. And you can again see with squash wine border, those bubbles are almost similar size. So it's not, it doesn't matter where you are. It seems like they're everywhere. Um, besides the caterpillars, it seems like I'm overemphasizing on caterpillars, but remember there are a number of these small insect pests like aphids. And as this slide tells you, there are different uh, different colors to an aphid. And the, it gets really confusing sometimes, just like caterpillars when they're small to identify them. But as they become mature, they're easier to identify 
uh, with some of the coloring. Uh, but there are different species. Um, the one that we see on, uh, on the bottom of the screen, cowpea aphid, uh, it's on the bottom middle. That's one of the largest species of aphids I've seen on, on uh, vegetable crops, but uh, that's a really distinct black aphid and you'll see them on peas. But uh, what I wanted to point out is watch out for these aphid mummies. You'll see these puffed up yellow bodies of aphids. Those are dead aphids uh, that have been infested with beneficial wasp. And if you have that, that's a good sign. Don't be scared. Uh, it's, that's a good thing to have those parasit parasitized aphids. Uh, but if you have an outbreak, like I have on the picture on top right, if you have aphids just on the terminal leaves and completely curling up those leaves, that's a bit too late to control aphids. You may have already done some, uh, they may have already done some, uh, uh, some economic loss in that case. So don't wait for outbreak, especially if you're an organic producer. Aphids, I have done years of research, they're still difficult pests to manage with organic control. You can do wonderful with, with conventional chemicals. Uh, they're highly selective. Conventional chemicals like Fulfill that aphids just jump off the plants when they see the bottle. Uh, very effective products, but we don't have that kind of products in organics that do not wait for an outbreak. Um, so control, scout and control early uh, for these aphids. Uh, I did not put a slide of the thrips. Uh, if you have thrips issues, they probably are showing up already. It's a bit too late. Uh, thrips migrate in, in mass earlier in the season and they infest crops like tomatoes and transmit the virus. So I did not put on the thrips uh, slide uh, because you probably already have it. Um, and uh, hopefully you did not have a loss or, or were able to monitor and, and control it. Uh, but also remember these uh, larger insect pests. These are the sucking insect pests. Uh, they have the similar mouth parts like aphids, but these are much bigger than aphids. And I have included the picture of the adults and the immature so you can see uh, <clears throat> the immatures look different from the adults, uh, not only in, the, in their coloration, but also their uh, wings. The, the young, uh, younger, the immature ones don't have the wings. So again, the point I'm trying to make is when you, if you see these nymphs, that's a great time to control them. Uh, of course, you can control them with some of the pyrethroid quick acting insecticides for the adults, but with organics, Oftentimes you have to target the immatures because you, you're basically trapping the immatures and they're much more vulnerable to organic insecticides and die from it. So we use this system with organic insecticides and trap crops uh, to, to uh, get a good kill of uh, sting bugs and leaf-footed bugs. Uh, but, and again, you have the picture of what they do to tomatoes. Um, I, again, I'm biased towards tomatoes because everybody loves tomatoes from garden to commercial. Um, and they are everywhere. So watch out for these insects. Uh, the harlequin bug is, is uh, more of a cool, cool season pest or on the coal crops, uh, the brassicas. Uh, you're now looking at some of the squash pests or cu cucurbit pests. And I wanted to show you this one. This is actually a um, picture of uh, uh, Indian cucumber. Uh, it's a variety from India that I'm growing in my backyard. And surprise, surprise, if I don't plant timely, they, these pickle worms will eat up those, those fruits. I mean, they're really, really, um, they, they're very good at finding my plants, uh, it seems. So, but if, again, uh, if you're planting late, expect some of these pickle worms and melon worms to show up on your, plant, on your plants and, and be ready to spray um, if, if you see them uh, on, you know, before they do too much damage. And they they completely live out their life inside the fruit, so really hard to detect um, early in the season. So uh, just make sure you're checking your your crop uh, regularly for the the moths. You can actually see these moths; uh, they're fairly big uh, moths here. And because it's got hot, um, and if you are using any synthetic pyrethroid or even organic pyrethrin, you can induce spider mites very easily. And uh, uh, I did years of research on spider mites and uh, chemicals uh, for on spider mites on peanuts. And so I have that picture of the uh, two spotted spider mite on peanut there, but that's incredible. You can see how bad they can get and that's induced by pesticide. So the way you can tell it, if you 
if you see spiromites all over your field after about seven to 10 days of a pyrethroid spray, you probably induce the mites with your, your pesticide application. If you have weather um, based, you see more of a uh, uneven distribution of these spiromites. You, you will see some hot spots. Um, and uh, there are again, multiple species of spiromites. The two spotted is the most common one, but there are russet mites and others that uh, you, you'll also, you can also see they're pretty bad on the south east part of the state. Um, uh, but again, um, if you mess up on controlling caterpillars with pyrethroids, um, you get spiromites. So be aware uh, and be very, um, be very careful choosing insecticide for application. Um, on the peas and beans, uh, again, there is a very nice uh, bulletin online on aces.edu. Uh, just type in insect pests of uh, peas, beans. You should be able to download that flyer, the, the, the uh, publication with pictures. But uh, multiple insects will feed on these little uh, bean plants if you have them. Uh, for example, the thrips and leaf hoppers will cause uh, distortion on the leaves. And then you have uh, small holes from flea beetles. And if you have grasshoppers, you have irregular feeding. So um, just to show you that one plant can have multiple insects attacking it, even though you may not see the insect, uh, it's difficult to scout sometimes. So when you're scouting, try to scout in the early in the morning hours when the insects are a little bit calm uh, and they're on the plants feeding. Uh, as the day goes by and it's too hot, they jump off the plants and they hide really well. So keep an eye out. Uh, remember for just a quick um, uh, pointers for if you're scouting, uh, make sure you are uh, correctly identifying insects. Don't uh, misjudge beneficials. They, the beneficials may look ugly, but they are there for a good reason. Uh, don't kill them. We need to protect uh, and conserve these beneficial insects. Uh, use insect monitoring tools that you have heard before from me and uh, Dr. Keshama mentioned them as well. Um, and I think uh, Jacob Kelly also mentioned the pheromone trap. So that's what we use. Uh, they're fairly uh, cost effective if you're a farmer to use them on your farm. And, and after a few years of, of these insect trapping, and if you keep good records, you will learn very quickly uh, what to do with these insects and when they're bad. Uh, but be consistent, whatever you do, be consistent and keep records and develop your IPM plan. Keep a record of your plan, um, whether you're organic uh, or conventional. I'm sure you keep pesticide application records, uh, but uh, have additional records. In fact, on the Farming Basics phone app, we, we actually have a record keeping tool that's gonna be available for small stuff. So you can use, use apps as well uh, for record keeping. And, but there is no replacement to direct scouting. So you, you have to scout uh, directly. Uh, you can use monitoring tools, but you gotta look in the crop and, and make sure you are uh, controlling them, especially if you are a high tunnel producer because they, these insects will spread like wildfire uh, throughout the crop when you have them planted so close. So uh, just keep a, uh, keep a good watch on those hot spots, and you can just treat the hot spots. When I talk about uh, control recommendations, again, you have heard me before, check out the, um, the other YouTube videos I've done. Uh, there's one YouTube video we did last year, uh, funded by SARE uh, program that has all the three levels of pest management mentioned. Um, so again, um, I always uh, tell people that not everything is for everyone. The IPM uh, recommendations uh, do change. Uh, between your cropping system the way you have. But again, uh, I try to always emphasize prevention tactics as well as therapeutic tactics, uh, which is the insecticide. And um, you, you can use bioinsecticides in, even in conventional systems. Uh, with bioinsecticides, the only issue is uh, the persistence can be uh, much shorter than some of these uh, synthetic products or chemical uh, conventional chemicals. So. You, you apply more of the bioinsecticides. Um, and I wanted to emphasize when I talk about conventional chemicals, uh, don't just think about seven or these, uh, some of the other pyrethroids. Uh, there are multiple uh, options now. We, we actually have more uh, of the, um, of, of very good products and they're all listed in the uh, 2022 vegetable handbook. Make sure you have the new ones because these products do change. 
But I wanted to mention <coughs> with the uh, the new ones that I marked on the screen, uh, for example, the feeding suppressants, uh, which basically uh, uh, stop the feeding and they have translaminar action and that include fulfill. Uh, you can see it on your screen there, uh, PQZ, Safina, uh, and then those are good for sucking insect pests and then collagen is for caterpillars. So really good products, check them out. If you haven't tried them, you'll not go back to your old sprays. If, you, if you're a farmer, they're worth trying. And then insect growth regulators. Uh, there are so many out there like Raimon, Intrepid, Intrepid Edge, uh, really good products. Uh, Courier and NAC for, are for white flies, which I didn't have a picture for, but if you have white fly issues, those are great products. But again, remember these are insect growth regulators. They don't act against adults. You have to uh, apply these insecticides on, on immatures. So you have to be scouring, but they are safer to natural enemies uh, compared to some of the other harsher older organochlorines or organophosphates, uh, and most of them are going away. And some of the pyrethroids, and pyrethroids are great, but just watch for the weather. You don't want spider mites um, to eat you up. Uh, so just be, be very careful. Uh, and um, again, there are many ways you can tank mix or rotate insecticides, uh, especially the organic one. If you have caterpillar issues, BT products really work well. They still work well, just they're challenged by the environment, by the weather conditions. So remember that, um, not that the BTs don't work. They're actually very effective. And you saw some of these registered on, product, on crops like hemp uh, for obvious reasons, they're the good products. But remember to use these BTs first if you have caterpillars and then go to a different product uh, like neem or pyganic. Uh, get, give this BT a chance to act. Uh, they won't flare up the mites for you. Um, so again, same thing with tank mix and, and rotations. We do a lot of research on, on these tank mixes and rotations to make it more cost-effective. Uh, so that's, but you, you will notice that we need almost a weekly application, a minimum of one weekly application. Sometimes if you're too hot and, and uh, depending on your location or pest pressure, you may have to do twice a week. So uh, it's a lot more with organic and you have to give BT time to act. Uh, this is just a slide on spider mites. Um, there are, uh, these are all conventional products, by the way. The last one that I have worked on is Portal, um, but there are other products like the older products like Acromite and Agrimec, really popular products. These are great for quick control. Um, Portal is very good if you have multi, multiple generations or multiple uh, crops and you want to protect your Future crop uh, portal has a very wide action as, and has a good residual, um, but again, label restrictions are there. So make sure you read the label and follow the label. Uh, don't follow the slides, check the label for to make sure um, that you're doing the right thing. Uh, and then this is something for home gardeners or urban farms that I work with. Uh, people ask me what are some of the best organic insecticides. I am bi biased towards these because I do a lot of research uh, with, with the companies that make them uh, over the years. So I'm kind of biased, but again, BT, uh, Dipel, or Thuricides are on the top. Uh, Zentari is for armyworms. Pyganic, spinosad-based products, which can be expensive, but sometimes they are the last thing you want to use. Uh, neem, insect cell soap. Uh, some these struggle with high pest pressure. So like I said, try not to use these organics against a very high pest population. Uh, you have to start using them early and regularly. And uh, under this heat, hot weather, um, check about uh, leaf burn. D make sure you treat um, a small um, number of plants before you treat the whole farm with some of these products. Uh, make sure that your crops don't burn. Uh, some of these heavy oil products can burn the leaves uh, under, under heat. And, and even in high tunnels, when there's 130 degrees in a high tunnel, uh, be very careful using some of these products. We spray typically in the evening hours when it calms down and it's cooler, uh, just to avoid plant burn. And this is just a reminder about um, uh, IPM, just, you know, there's no, no substitute to scouting. Pest prevention is better than cure. Manage insects when they're small or low in numbers. Always protect natural enemies because it's hard to, to add uh, add them, it's expensive if you wanted to buy some of these natural enemies. And then integrate, integrate, integrate this. You have to look at multiple ways. 
And think about the plant health. Um, I think somebody else mentioned about plant health. Uh, make sure you have good uh, plant health. Plants are healthy, stress-free. Uh, they'll help your insect, uh, your IPM. And finally, I'll just uh, stop after this one. Um, check out the uh, Alma Beginning Farmer Program, which is the old program uh, for all farmers. AlamaBeginningFarmer.com is your website and Ann Chambers is the coordinator. And then we have just launched Operation Grow for veteran farmers. So Operation Grow is specifically for veteran farmers. And if you scan the code on your screen on the right, uh, bottom right, it takes you to our registration page. So Operation Grow, Operation-Grow.com is the web page. Lots of good information there. And once again, thank you to all the uh, supporting agencies uh, and the funding agencies that help with these research.